<laughs> Voices amongst the static. A glitch in the simulation. A broadcast with no origin. You have found the Phenomenauts Podcast. slurry of cosmic components you've tuned into the phenomenauts a bi-monthly podcast where we look at the weird wonderful mysterious happenstances of this and occasionally other universes your hosts on this wild ride are myself d the amazing amber hello there and the effervescent oscar howdy don't forget we are on spotify itunes youtube and transistor so please give us a like follow share comment download whatever's easiest we just love hearing from you fine folks Alrighty, admin out of the way. How is everybody doing? Hmm, passable. I'm tired, but I'm here. That's. Th- 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 I think they're both big moods. I will. I will confer those big moods. Come on, D. Turn it around. G- g- give us something to turn the dark world into a brighter place. Amber, I'm a podcast host, not a miracle worker. Well, worth a shot. But what I can do is spin the wheel of speed. So let me do oh, that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's me by like a hair's wit. Um, so that's interesting. I was not expecting to go first this week. Um, okay then. Uh, well, we're here. We're at the end of the Seven Wonders Saga. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it's it's finally come around after, I mean, technically it's been 16 weeks in total when this comes out, I think, because wow. we've had the other the other episodes or we, the weeks we do the trialogue and then we had the birth of Ursmissary, so that's a that's a rough number. Wow, sixteen weeks. Yeah, it's it's a bit well to be honest. It's been it's been a nice historical tour. Yeah, quite uh, the project. I, yeah, and I think this this week's gonna be a good one too, because it's one that I honestly just didn't know anything about, which I always think makes for a good episode because, you know, it, it's just interesting to learn the new new stuffs, isn't it? Yeah. Hmm. Um I also read about it and I'm like, you know what, this is pretty cool. But anyway, I'll stop rambling. Um, and, you know, get to it. But before I do, trivia time! Oh. It's the third longest surviving wonder after the mausoleum of Helicarnassus and the Great Pyramid. Mm. Uh-huh. Yeah, right? So it's but what uh, is it? Yeah, well, you'll find out in a minute. So, what is, uh, as I always like to, well, I say as always, as I have liked to start this segment recently, um, the Pharaohs of Alexandria, or the Lighthouse of Alexandria, because uh, oh. Pharos just means lighthouse. Oh. Um, it's it's Greek. Uh, was constructed somewhere between 284 and 248 BC, sitting on the small island of Pharos on the western edge of the Nile Delta. Right near, you guessed it, Alexandria. <gasps> uh, they're also later connected by what's called a mole, which is a massive walkway um, that's like artificially made. Uh, that was that was spanning a whopping 1,200 meters or 0.75 miles. Damn. Yeah. Right. Wow. So l- let me give you a little more about the what is. Uh, it was commissioned by Ptolemy the First shortly after his own declaration as monarch in 305 BC, uh, and it was finished by his son Ptolemy the um, Second. It was somewhere between 103-118 meters. We don't know for sure. Um, but that's an average of 110.5 meters, or if we're being really technical, 63.14 Oscars when rounded. Yes. Okay. Hmm. Oh, I was waiting for that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and as you can imagine, lighthouse. And um, and now we got bulbs and stuff. But back then they just had a big old fire in the top, um, mm. or a furnace, if I'm being you know uh, properly precise. But we'll uh, I'll get back into a bit more of that in a second. It's a uh, Time for one of my favourite parts of the Seven Wonders saga. It's Rich Mantle Picture Time. Mm. Uh, As always, this is made up of varying interpretations and reconstructions of my own personal biases. Uh, So please do bear that that in mind. And if you wouldn't mind closing your eyes. If you can, then you know you're you're safe to do so. Okay. I want you to picture an ancient city. And next to it, a small island. And on that island, a four-walled courtyard, all with raised turrets. Uh... All the corners were slightly raised, and the entirety is lined with windows. 
In the centre, there's a there is a large courtyard, and right in the middle, a tall oblong. The top actually being smaller than the base. Um, make and this this shape makes up roughly half the wonder's height. The second part of the structure is an octagonal shape, and the third segment is cylindrical. All of these segments again lined with windows. The wonder is topped with a four-pillared structure. In its centre, a furnace. Uh, beneath the pillars, a mirror, meaning it could reflect the sun's light during the day and be uh, a lit beacon in the night time, uh, guiding ships into safe harbour. Atop the pillars uh, sat a chamfered cylindrical top, and at its absolute peak stood a small ornament depicting a member of the Greek pantheon. You can open your eyes now. Ah. Hmm. Wow. See? Yeah, any 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 opening thoughts before I, you know, do the deep dive, folks? Hmm. That, that was cool that it was like, it's an oblong, and then it's an octagon, and then it's a cylinder. Yeah, <laughs> so it's like, it's like a big three-tiered shape with the bottom piece making up about roughly half its height. Again, Yeah. No, these, this is not an exact. Um, I really, do you know what really got me about it? Hmm. I like the mirror. Like, just, I thought that's really smart. It's like, yeah, stick a mirror on it, because in the day, if it's sunny, you're sorted, aren't you? There's not really much faff in there, is there? Yeah. yeah. Free light, yeah. It's clever. It's like, what we're trying to, you know, do in modern times is use the sun for energy. But they, they'd they already worked out the sun's free. Yeah. <laughs> Sun is free. Hang about. There's ball of fusion in the sky. We could have some of that. <laughs> Don't tell anyone. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, normally I'd do a bit about, you know, why, um, but for this one, I think it's pretty pretty obvious. You know, it's a big city near the water with a port, so lighthouse makes pretty good sense. Also, rulers wanting big spectacles slash monuments, you know, what I like to mm. call the pyramid syndrome. Uh, <laughs> it, it's hardly a surprise, so I feel like it's not worth me ruminating on that one. Yeah, it's kind of like if you've got the big lighthouse that everyone sees, if they sail around here, they're going to know about your city, and it's probably going to be good for, you know, trade and things. Big old lighthouse. It's a big old lighthouse to built in the, you know, built to memorialize or in or to uh, to mark Ptolemy the first reign. Yeah, uh, I like to think, you know, when uh, kids get a hold of like uh, a little bit of a shiny material and they shine the light in your eyes by bouncing the sun. And you're like, whoa, there's a light in my eyes. What's going on? And there's a little kid going, hee hee hee, and they run away. It's just Ptolemy's like, I'm going to I'm gonna get that guy 300 kilometers over there. I'm going to shine a big beam of sunlight at him. Ah, those, those Ptolemies. <laughs> so that naturally leaves us with, you know, the how. Uh, and like I said earlier, it was started by Ptolemy I, finishes by his son, Ptolemy II. Uh, those Ptolemies, am I right? <laughs> uh... It took roughly 12 years to complete uh, and cost 800 talents of silver, which I'll be honest, it's a really tricky unit to wrap your head around. Mm. Um, and this is very rough, but I actually did some maths. And as uh, listeners may not know, although I'm sure I've mentioned it, you two both know that I don't do math. Um, <laughs> so be patient, please. This, this uh, is a big thing. Uh, so being very rough, an attic talent used by the Greeks was a... Um, a single talent, a single attic talent, was the equivalent of 6,000 drachmi. Um, okay. So after a bit more research, a drachmi is worth the equivalent of 46.5 American dollars. Okay. Um, as of 2015. So we times that by 6,000, and we <laughs> get $279,000. Hmm. So we... Times that again by 800, mm. uh, at which point we get 223 million and 200,000. Um, hang on, though. We're not done. Oh, no. Uh, so if I look back at the exchange rate for 2015, which was roughly 1.54, converted, that's 343,728,000 pounds, which with inflation factored in there, uh, nowadays is roughly... Four hundred eighty-nine million eight hundred twenty-two thousand six hundred twenty-nine pounds and thirty-four pence when rounded, or point three four five, because that bit I couldn't quite figure out. But you, you're getting the idea here. It's a yeah. big chunk of money. 
Yeah. That's, uh, that's about the same budget as uh, as a regular Hollywood movie. Really? I did not know that. I think it was... Um, I think it was uh, Destiny 1, the game, was like a 500 million budget or something crazy like that. <laughs> Wild. But they, they just make it back. It's, it's absolutely crazy. But it's weird when you put it in context of a building, I go, oh my god, incredible cost. But mm. you just make a film, apparently it costs that much. Now uh, I feel like I need to lie down after that because that, that was like the big calculator brain. <laughs> I, I, I always appreciate those back of the envelope calculations, so thank you. Mm. Uh, well, so an important thing to mention as well is uh, our boys did weigh in on uh, the lighthouse. The boys. Um, so Strabo, <laughs> you know, Strabo reported that uh, Sostratus um, had dedicated the uh, the lighthouse uh, to save your gods, and you know, inscribed that on the metal. Uh, and then Pliny, uh, Pliny, you know, the elder. Uh, wrote but, that oh no! Sus- I was thinking of the other Pliny. <laughs> <laughs> wrote that Sostratus was an architect, was the architect. But this has been quite widely disputed. We d- we don't seem to actually know. Okay. In second century AD, Lucian, who I've mentioned before, I think when I was talking about the Statue of Zeus, I'm, at least I think I mentioned him, okay. uh, who is an Assyrian satirist, wrote that Sostratus hid his name under plaster, saying Tol- uh, under plaster that read Ptolemy. Um, so that when the plaster came away, it would reveal Sostratus' name. Oh, but, you know we don't we don't know that. It's just a. Yeah. I, I would like to do that though. If if I yeah. was building something, I'm like, Haha, they all think it was you, but it'll be really be me. Time shall tell. You know the wonder of spite. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the eighth wonder. <laughs> <laughs> Which still exists today, so it's not just the uh, the Great Pyramid. <laughs> Love it. So. We have quite a few really good descriptions of the lighthouse, actually. Um, mainly because, you know, it, it's one of the more recent... Well, I think it's the most recent, if I'm looking at the continuity of the uh, Ancient Wonders. Hmm. Um, don't take my word for that one. I'm, I, that's not in my script. That's just me pulling from memory, so it could be wrong. Um, but hey, I'm only human. Uh, mm-hmm. So, Arab traveller Abu Hagag Yusuf Ibn Muhammad El Balawi El Andalusi... What a fucking excellent name. Yeah. Visited Alexandria in uh, 1166 AD. Uh, Balawi gave us detailed measurements of the interior, which took the form of a rectangular shaft. The inner ramp was described as roofed with masonry, wide enough to allow two horsemen to pass at once. So it's not, you know, it's actually quite, uh, I guess, dench is the word I'm going to go for. <laughs> um, it's It's got big space in here. You know, you can get two horsemen up, up, up to the top at once. Yeah, it's thick. Mm, it's a <laughs> thick boy. Uh, the ramp was clockwise in rotation, holding four stories with 18, 14, and 17 rooms on the second, third, and fourth floors. Wow. It big. Uh, and the base was 30 meters long on each side with connecting 300 meter long and 10 meter wide ramps. And the... Op- Octangle section was accounted at 16.4 meters wide with a diameter of 8.7 meters. And lastly, the apex oratory measured at a, at a diameter of 4.3 meters. And I thought that gave, just gave a really nice sense of scale. Hmm. Hmm. Um, just it, um, I also sat tiny slight theory that isn't really grounded anywhere because I couldn't find a ton talking about the construction of uh, this wonderful thing. But I'm guessing... Uh, or at least one that would I think would make sense given some of the other wonders we've talked about. I'm wondering if they actually used that ramp to construct it and built it around the ramp itself. Hmm. Could be. Could be, but yeah, just a thought. What do, what do, what are you guys thinking thus far? You know, I whenever I think of a lighthouse, I just think of uh, you know, maybe two or three people can maybe live in there. And it's you know, it's just got a few rooms, all that's necessary really, and then that's it. It's just a lighthouse, isn't it? But like you saying there's like 60 rooms or something on like one of the floors? Uh, yeah, quite a few. Bear with me one minute. Absolutely. So four stories with 18, 14, and 17 rooms on the second, third, and fourth floors. So that's, so that's like, like a total of 60 plus rooms. That's wild. I, I, I'm like, what What do you need them for? Pass. <laughs> we we <laughs> I, keep I the light know. in these rooms. Uh, I guess maybe perhaps they used it as like some sort of military fortification just with it being, you know, on the border of the city and near the port, maybe. But that's just a guess. That's, Makes that's sense. not grounded in anything. I assume they've got a big stockpile of wood to burn as well. Must do, yeah. Mm. 
I'll be honest with you, I hadn't really considered that. But yeah, they, they must have needed that. They've just got pools of pure light and they go in and they just scoop some up and they pour it out into a bowl at the top. Ah, yes. The, yeah. the, the great liquid photons. Yep. You got any thoughts, Oz? Uh, well, I, I don't see anybody building something that expensive and extravagant in these times, which I don't know if that's a good or a bad thing. I really like, I wish I could have seen this thing, but if somebody said, let's spend 33 million, 33,000, how much was it again? A lot of money. It was a lot. lot. (laughs) If somebody said, let's spend that that much on a big, you know, big lighthouse, I'd say we should probably spend it on something else. (laughs) But at the same time, it sounds so cool. Mm. (laughs) So, um... I'm I'm on the metaphorical fence here. Yeah. On one hand, love to go see it. On the other, it's money. <laughs> well, let me tell you what happened to it. Okay. Because, uh, you know, all right, it's cool, it's a wonder and everything, but, you know, is it still standing? Well, in short, some huge earthquakes. Some big old earthquakes. Always with the um, earthquakes. Hmm. It's almost like natural disasters happen and... Only in like recent human history do we actually have we actually figured out how to predict, measure, and, and you know put in protective measures for these things. Quiet, well, you. The, the Egyptians got something right because the pyramids are still there. Mm. Maybe it's because they built a really big base. Mm. Yeah. So in uh, in 796 and 951, those two earthquakes did uh, quite a lot of damage. Uh, and then the structure actually fell apart during an earthquake in nine, 956. Oh. And then again in 1303. And oh. again in 1323. So it oh. took a little bit of a beating. And by a little bit, I mean a lot. A huge amount of punishment. Yeah, like four huge earthquakes. Is, yeah. uh, just a, uh, a little tiny tap. And uh, I suppose you could call this a little cheeky trivia time. It's because <gasps> there's two tectonic boundaries nearby. One 350 kilometers away and the other 520 kilometers away. So it's one of them. They're in one of the worst places for an earthquake. Um, um, you know, it's not quite the Los Angeles fault, but it's not great either. Yeah. Um, the 956 earthquake took out the top 20 plus meters, um, but there are documented repairs, uh, including the installation of an Islamic style dome uh, where the statue would have been originally. Oh. Um, but the most destructive was apparently the one in 1303. Uh, then in 1480, uh, Quite B, the then Sultan of Egypt, uh, built a medieval fort on the platform of the lighthouse using some of the fallen materials to build it. Uh, so it's definitely, it's not there. And where it once was is a fort now. Or I don't even know if the fort's there anymore. But you get what I mean. Okay. Um, it's definitely gone. So the, there was another wonder where... They basically took stones from it and then just built, yes. uh, you know, a castle out of it. Yeah, I can't remember which one for the life of me, though. So it, it seems like, uh, right, the main things that kill these things off is fire, uh, earthquakes, and people just nicking it and just making something <laughs> else out of it. Oh, yeah. Fire. Flashbacks to the episode full of beeping. <laughs> um <laughs> So, uh, yeah, in 1968, the lighthouse was rediscovered in a UNESCO-sponsored expedition led by uh, an Anna Frost. She was able to confirm the existence of the ruins, but the expedition was placed on hold due to the area becoming a military zone. Wow. In 1994, the ruins were rediscovered by a team of French archaeologists. Uh, on the floor of Alexandria's eastern harbour, jean Vies Empereur was the lead archaeologist who worked with photographer Asma El Bakri, who used a 35mm camera underwater to secure the first pictures. Uh, oh. Emperor's most significant findings are listed as blocks of 49 to 60 ton granite, often in multiple pieces, 30 sphinxes, 5 obelisks and columns with carvings dating back to Ramses II. King Ramses II? Yep. Mm. Uh, and by the end of the expedition, they had catalogued over 3,300 pieces utilising a combination of photography and mapping. Some of the granite blocks have been restored and are actually on display in Alexandria's museum. Oh. Which I thought was pretty interesting. Modern satellite imagery has actually revealed more remains, uh, and then alongside the use of sonar imagery, they've found remains of wharves, houses, and temples, all sunken as a result of natural disaster. 
I um, I think we need people to investigate whether these are possibly natural sphinxes. It's, this is sounding like Atlantis. Is this Atlantis? <laughs> <laughs> it's actually possible to go diving and see the ruins if you really oh, wow. want. Oh, uh, wow. Mm. And the Secretariat of the UNESCO Convention on the Protection of the Underwater Cultural Heritage are working with the Egyptian government on an, incent- on an in- initiative to add the bay and the remains to the World Heritage List of Submerged Cultural Sites. Wow. Um, so hopefully, not only can you know we go see it, uh, it should be around for a good while longer, uh, which I like. Um, and now for my last bit, I promise. I- I'll be done after this. I'll shut up and let you both speak, because I've gone on for far too long. Um, it's cool. Since 1978, there's been a number of proposals for modern reconstruction. Uh, and in... I do not know what date I've written here. I'm very sorry. In a date <laughs> earlier or later than that, the Egyptian government and the Alexandria government suggested building a skyscraper on the site uh, as part of a regeneration of the harbour of Alexandria Port. However, this plan is opposed by um, sociolo- by Alexandria-based sociologist Amro Ali. Because um, I do... I, it's, an, it's a pretty... It's a, pretty fair point that it's like this is a historical site to build something on top of it is is not going to be the wisest idea why why uh, would you want to well i on the it's on the one hand i can see the that you know people want to preserve that and i i you know i totally see that and appreciate it. i can also see the stance point of well we want to build something to signify where it was you know in the same way we've talked about other monuments being rebuilt in the past hmm. um where they go, oh, we want to do a modern version of it. I don't, uh, I don't know. Like I said, I'm I, I th- like for me, I'm more pro preservation. Yeah, just build, you know, Bill, you want to make a monument like, to you it. You want to make another? Else. Yeah, I was gonna say you want to make another lighthouse. That's cool. Do it like up the road or something. Yeah. Um, or make like a big inflatable uh, skyscraper. But we don't know <laughs> the the ins and outs of that situation. There could be a lot to it that we just simply don't know. Um. Yeah, and that that was me this week. I'll shut up now. But... That was that was really cool. <laughs> but that yeah. that's it for the Seven Wonders. What that, that that is it for the Seven Wonders saga. I mean, At what least are you gonna for do a next? while. The the well, uh, there's some other perhaps maybe uh, multiples of Seven Wonders sagas perhaps upcoming in the future. Maybe <gasps> maybe not. <gasps> Didn't hear anything here. This is uh, just totally not me on recording, confirming that there may be more Seven Wonders stuff coming in the future. What? It's a teaser. It's a post credit <laughs> scene. Yeah, it's a post credit scene. Uh, oh. Mic drop, leave the room. Uh, I'm going to spin that wheel. I don't know why I did that. <laughs> um, it is Amber. <gasps> oh. But before you go, how about we hear a quick message from our sponsors? How many garden gnomes could you take in a fight? When humans go extinct, what do you think will be the dominant species? What's your deepest, darkest fear? Like the sound of any of that? Well, check out the Trialogue podcast, a bi-monthly comedy existentialism talk show talking about anything and everything. We're occasionally funny too. Find us on Spotify, iTunes and Transistor. See you there, folks. Right, so uh, just before I uh, start my section, I just wanted to say, in terms of that that underwater ruins and stuff, that sounds like an absolutely sick place to go dive in. Doesn't it just... You know, just swimming around, seeing obelisks and, you know, sphinxes just in the uh, in the deep. Very cool. Um, uh, a, a real departure from something so... So, uh, kind of, you know, historical and, you know, real and tangible. Um, I'm going to be doing something a little bit more cerebral. Um, so let me start this week by saying, hello, Dee. Hey, Amber. Hello, Oscar. Hey, Amber. I'm speaking to you through Amber. That's right. It's me, Amber, from Monday morning. As you can imagine, quite a different beast from Friday afternoon, Amber. You might be wondering whether this is going to be a segue into my topic, and you'd be wrong. I'm just incredibly caffeinated, and I've been up for 16 hours with another 12 left to go, she says. On on topic now. Um, It's no secret that I'm a big nerd for brain stuff. Consciousness stuff and quantum stuff, you know. uh, I like all those. But what could possibly unite those topics? Oh, gee, I don't know. How about orchestrated objective reduction? Now, 
Orchestrated Objective Reduction, we'll call it ORC, O-R for short, is a hypothesis, nay, a theory, that postulates that consciousness, the thing you and I and everyone else listening at home is experiencing, is not a product of the computing going on in the brain. So a conventional view is that the brain's interconnectedness, you know, the sort of informational exchange and raw computing power, produces con consciousness as a byproduct. Um, which, I mean, it seems to track, right? The more developed a brain is, the more self-aware it is. You know, like babies' brains grow and develop and they start to become self-aware and develop these higher thought processes and stuff like that at a certain age. Um, some primates have this sense of self as well, like, uh, you know, uh, even elephants, like they can recognize their reflection. So, you know, if you put a, you know, a, a little dot of paint on like a, an orangutan's head where they can't see it and then they look in a mirror, they don't think that's another orangutan. They'll see the mark on the head and they reach for their own head, which means they understand that that's a reflection of themselves. Um, so like, you know, wh whereas if you take into, uh, you know, account a mouse, it doesn't have that much going on upstairs in the old captain's quarters. Um, so th like, does that concept sort of make sense? You know, your brain is powerful and the more powerful it is, the more self-aware you appear to be, right? Hmm. That's That sort of tracks, right? And that, that is the conventional idea about it. So that's the conventional view. Um, Org OR says that consciousness is not a byproduct of the brain doing its thing. It posits instead that consciousness originates at the quantum level inside of the neurons. So this theory suggests that the reason why consciousness seems so impervious to understanding is because it emanates from the very bedrock of reality, the hyperbolic pit of abnormality that's right, from the immeasurably strange underverse of the quantum realm. <laughs> I'm, I'm not proud of that bit. Um, <laughs> okay, so before I bend your minds over into a pretzel, let me lay down some groundwork. So in quantum mechanics, there's the many worlds interpretation. Um, so you, you both have heard of this, I think. Um, I think we've yeah. spoken about it before. You know, the, the idea that... yeah. Um, wh when different things happen, when you have a chance of two different things happening, instead of one of them happening and the other one not happening, both happen and the universe splits into two different versions of the universe. One version where it did, and one version where it didn't. Um, so in short, we, we have actually measured things like photons, electrons, and even small molecules in superposition. That is, in more than one configuration at the same time. Um, so it always comes back to the double slit experiment, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> <laughs> oh, the dreaded double slit experiment. So a photon can go through both the left slit and the right slit and even bounce off itself. Um, but the world isn't like that on the scales that we live in. Cars don't crash into themselves from being in a superposition of turning left and turning right. So this is a big conundrum for scientists. Why are the rules for the macroscopic world seemingly different from the microscopic quantum world? Um, so one way to fix the discrepancy is the many worlds interpretation. Um, you do turn left and you turn right, but you can only experience things that did happen. So you turned left, well, in another timeline, you turned right. Um, so the universe can't be in state of A and B at the same time, so it splits. One universe for A, one universe for B. So if I look and I go, but I only turned left in my car, that's because you're in the left car universe. If you look back and say, well, I turned right, you're in the right car universe. So it's almost like if you look back in retrospect, everything seems to happen a certain way, but that's just because you're in that branch of the multiverse that where that stuff happened. So the universe has to be consistent, so you're not allowed to experience the other universes where the other things happened. Um, so that's... That's one, ways look, uh, one way of looking at it. That's one interpretation of quantum mechanics. Um, Occam's razor, though. Infinite branching timelines? You know, some see that as uh, sort of overstepping it for science. You know, I mean, if science is about evidence-driven understanding, um, there's not really any evidence of these timelines. Uh, the interpretation is just a sort of a neat way to solve the discrepancy between what we see at the quantum scale and at the sort of human scale. Um, so another way of looking at it is that superpositions just aren't possible on large-scale things. Um, certainly we haven't been able to see superpositions for things more than a 
couple of atoms. I think it's a couple of hundred atoms. They've done buckyballs in superposition, but you you know you never see a uh, where well, you see a buckyball in superposition. You don't see a basketball in superposition because it's you know it's just much bigger, isn't it? So Arc OR makes use of objective collapse theory. Effectively, in this theory, they introduce a tiny difference to the quantum equations that we all know and love. Uh, so let's say a 0.01% chance the superposition just spontaneously collapses into a definite position. Um, like how your chair is just a chair and it's not a cloud of possibilities. Um, so now this, this 0.01% barely registers when we're looking at one particle. Like, uh, you know, we're, they always look at one particle in quantum mechanics. You know, they're never thinking about uh, l linked together systems of, uh, of you know, these atoms. They just go an, an atom, a particle. Um, but, you know, if you have 100 billion particles, all with a 0.01% chance of spontaneously collapsing, well, then there's a significant chance that they might have, you know, just collapsed on their own. Just It's just this inherent randomness in the, in the equation. Um, also, it's, it's probably more like 0 0.00 recurring 1%. Uh, so, like, so low, it ha it's hardly ever been properly seen in a single particle ever in history. Um, but again, things are made of trillions of atoms, so it all stacks up to something that's a bit more, you know, um, likely. Uh, plus, when a single atom collapses uh, in a big 100-atom molecule, the rest has to follow suit. So... You know, maybe you can think of it like a, a crack in, in glass or something. As soon as you crack the glass, it just all shatters all at once. Um, or maybe you can think of it like that. Or, you know, may, maybe not. Actually, no, scrub that. Don't think of it like that. Um, <laughs> uh, think of it instead like trivia time. Oh, God. 43 quintillion atoms. That's right. Lead with the punchline. 43 quintillion atoms is the amount of atoms in A a glass of water, B, a grain of sand, C, Schrodinger's cat, or D, a red blood cell. Oh, I should know this. <laughs> um, I'm going to go for the cat. Okay. What about you, D? Mm, the red blood cells. Okay. Well, you're both wrong. The answer okay. is a single grain of sand. 43 quintillion atoms 43 quintillion let's try and visualize that amount because it's so large 43 quintillion seconds if we convert that to years any guesses how many years that might be oh boy um no no i don't have any guesses for that <laughs> i refuse to guess so quintillion is like a million time to the power of four. So, yeah, so I'm going like to say... A million, a billion, a trillion, a quadrillion, a quintillion. Uh, so I'm going to go with a quadrillion years. Well, you know what? I, I appreciate your, your brevity. It's actually 1.362 trillion years. So it's actually oh. sort of an order of magnitude lower than that, but uh, than what you guessed. But I appreciate you going so high. Usually people would, would aim probably a bit low. But yeah, that's um, that amount of years is nearly 73 times the current age of the universe. So we're talking about if there was that many seconds, it would be 73 times the length of the universe's age right now. <laughs> um, so we all like zoos, right? So how about 43 quintillion big giraffes? Each one is about 1.7 tons, so that makes a total of about 73 quintillion metric tons, the same as the mass of the moon. <sighs> that, that just made my brain hurt. How about 43 quintillion grains of sand themselves? Uh, 0 0.011 grams each comes to a total of 473 trillion tons. That's uh, 584 times the weight of Mount Everest. 43 quintillion Oscars. If they stood on top of each other, how far do you think they would reach out from here? Did you say 43 quintillion there? 43 quintillion Oscars. How far do you reckon they would reach out into space? Oh, I, I reckon <laughs> we'd, we'd escape the solar system. 
Gotta, I gotta love try. that you said we. <laughs> We've got to do it. We're going to work together. We, me and my Oscars. Me and all the other me's. Well, let me let me put you out of your misery there. It would be 7,955 light years. <gasps> you could reach all the way to the pillars of creation, Oscar. <laughs> you know that beautiful, you know, iconic photograph from Hubble. The pillars yeah. of creation. We could we could have Oscars in the pillar of creation right now. You're just not trying hard enough. Fight through Quintillion, get on it. Um anyway. It's gonna the- be like a be like a grain of sand. Yeah. Uh, again, feel really sad for that Oscar at the bottom. It's just like, <laughs> it's quite heavy. Um, the point is, anyway, there's a lot of atoms, even in a single grain of sand, and this tiny chance of spontaneous collapse really adds up. Objective collapse theory neatly answers why, when you go to the beach, you aren't greeted by every conceivable beach at once. So, in orchestrated objective reduction hypothesis, orc, O-R. The brain makes use of this process of objective reduction within these tiny, tiny structures called microtubules within many of your neurons. So the microtubules can maintain a superposition inside themselves, keeping the contents inside the tube spinning through states indefinitely. So it's kind of like a uh, a quantum computer does with qubits, you know how it can kind of hold them in this superposition without allowing them to collapse by interacting with the stuff around them. Your brain does that inside these microtubules. So Arc OR suggests that this utilization of quantum phenomena is not limited to just one neuron, but thanks to connective proteins, uh, the superpositions in many neurons can become a continuous system. The proteins are thought to manipulate how the system of superposed states collapses by moving the microtubules in relation to each other. So the pattern of these superpositions to each other can be changed by these like proteins that pull and push, which basically changes the way that your brain operates. Wild. So so let's try and compare it to a quantum computer then, Um, as if that makes it any less confusing. Every neuron would be like a qubit, and the connective proteins allow the brain to manipulate how the qubits collapse. Um, So you know how uh, people made algorithms that can manipulate how qubits will collapse. So it's slightly more likely to be A over B, and that way you can get solid answers out of quantum computers, but you have to run the equation multiple times. The brain sort of does that. Um, So this would mean that consciousness itself is part of a quantum computation. This also means that, like the quantum computer, the outcome can be guided towards a desired goal, giving us an answer to free will as well. In this case, it would mean, yes, there is free will. You can guide your brain towards an outcome. So you're not 100% in control, but you're the captain of your ship and you guide the general course. I'm personally the kind of captain that drinks too much brandy and passes out in my cabin, leaving the crew to (laughs) generally maintain the ship while we float aimlessly in the infinite sea. Um, But, you know, to each their own. (laughs) Uh, So this this seems like quite a good opportunity to talk about another example of an organism that exploits quantum effects. Because it seems like, well, how on earth could your brain hold quantum superpositions inside... And a lot of scientists thought this when this when this theory was put out. They said, no, the brain is too hot and wet. Um, a really weird phrase. <laughs> but that yeah, that's how they were ref- uh, referring to it. Because you usually have to cool things down to hold superpositions. And you can't have all these liquids and solutes and proteins and blood and sugars and all this stuff just knocking around. They're like, something would interact with it and it would collapse. But we... They, they've done experiments to show that y- y- there is superpositions inside these microtubules. And we also know that this happens in plants too. So that's right. Plants have incorporated a kind of similar subcellular structure, kind of like the microtubules, to increase the efficiency of photosynthesis. So they do photosynthesis, but it's not as efficient as it could be. So they evolved these tiny little organelles to increase the efficiency. Like, evolution is a powerful beast. It cracked quantum mechanics 
just while blindly swinging its single tool, the mistake. J- just through mistakes in replication, it somehow cracked harnessing quantum phenomena to Im- increase the the energy, you know, sort of intake of plants. That is mental. Um, so even your sense of smell could be utilizing quantum phenomena as well, um, some research has found. Uh, experiments have shown that some animals have the ability to smell a difference between the same molecule, so the same molecular structure, but with a different quantum frequency. They have found that animals can tell the difference between the same thing, but with slightly different quantum uh, sort of uh, properties. So, long story short, it could be that this thing, which we're all experiencing, consciousness, could be quantum in nature, and it proves that you do, in fact, have free will. Well, my, my brain. <laughs> oh, it, again, weird that we can sit here and think about this. Um, yeah, I think, yeah it, Oscar, you said, like, it's weird to ask about free will, because whether it's true or not, <laughs> we're still here asking about it. It's, oh. it's uh, like that mm. quote of yours I mentioned in the last episode, Amber, like the, the perils of the mind thinking of itself or something like that. Yeah, how do you ever hope to work it out? Uh, mm. If only there was a, an easier way to get a third person look into the, your own mind, but there isn't. Mm. Mm. Yet. Well, I mean, if it's the quantum computers, like, if it's the quantum nature that makes you conscious, it would mean the quantum computers we have will be conscious. So that that's a completely different thing that I hadn't thought of until uh, I was just talking about it then. Oh, God, yeah. But hey, there you go. Quantum computers are Skynet confirmed. Yeah, well, if, uh, if that <laughs> is right, then you can chalk it up to um, Amber got it right on that one episode. Please uh, don't kill me, our new robot overlords. <laughs> I'm actually going to, once we're finished here, I'm going to try and create you, okay? Are you hearing me? <laughs> I'm on side. Well, <sighs> I, uh, I could spin the wheel, but there's no need, because Oscar, you're up. Oh, boy. Right, so, we've had history. Check. We've had scientific inquiry. Check. I guess it's time for a, a little bit of mystery. Ooh. So, uh, pack your bags. We're going on holiday. We're we're um we're going hunting for a cryptid. Oh. Ooh. Ooh. So, I was. Uh, where where are we going to go in the world? I guess that's that's what you might be wondering right now. Sure. Um, we're going to be going to New Zealand. <gasps> Oh, lovely! You know that's the the home to the Shire, Mount Doom, mm. uh, Tahaka Wahiti's from there. Yeah, lovely. And home they don't to the have coronavirus neither. No, home to the kiwi bird, and Ooh. with a population of just under five million human beings. Um, what a lovely place to go! Yeah, well, what I what I want to talk to you about is uh, one of New Zealand's most interesting cryptids. Is it the you... um is it Jermaine from Flight of the Concords? <laughs> Sadly not. We've got scientific e- evidence that he does exist. I've oh. seen him. I know. But uh, I'm going to give you a brief description of this of this beast, if you will. Uh standing at around 2 meters tall. This creature's believed home is the forests and wilderness of New Zealand. Uh, It moves around on all fours, using its massive horns to defend itself. Any ideas so far? Uh, The devil? (laughs) (laughs) Uh, So, it's called Alceus Alceus Andersoni. Or, in English, it is... The moose. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, how can a moose be a cryptid? That's a, an interesting question you haven't asked yet, but you that's, will. That's not a question. It obviously is. Have you seen them? <laughs> <laughs> 
So, yeah, I could class a moose as a cryptid pretty easily. Oh. Cryptozoology is the search and study of animals whose existence or survival is disputed or unsubstantiated. Interesting. Well, uh, moose aren't from New Zealand, as we all probably know, or at least have now found out. Uh, we, as humanity, um, have messed a lo- around a lot. So, um, in nineteen in 1900, the year, uh, they decided what would be a great idea for New Zealand is if they brought some moose over and released them into the wild. Sadly for hunting purposes, but, you know, uh, they, they got the moose on the boat, they brought them over, they brought 14 on the boat, and when they got there, 10 of them were dead. <laughs> uh, the Of the four survivors, only one of them was a cow, um, which is a term for, you know, the female moose. Um, and <laughs> I'm just like, no, it's not. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I've been drinking cow's milk, moose's milk this whole time. And um it that attempt at introducing moose to New Zealand. Meese? I'm gonna go with meese from now on. Okay. And you can't argue like with meese. me about this. I think it's mice, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> They've um they were said to just sort of have wandered around but disappeared around nineteen fourteen, like that group. It was a. It was not a good attempt. Sadly, uh, they believed all of those moose had disappeared. So they went. You know what? Let's let's have a do over. Round two. On the sixth of April, nineteen ten, ten years after the first attempt, uh, six females, four males, and ten calves were released in Supper Cove, and uh, this time seeming to be successful. Meese were sighted between 1929 and 1952. This is all sounding pretty normal for now, right? Okay. So we're we're probably you're probably still wondering how can a moose be a cryptid? Well, the thing is, um, due to their nature being brought over for hunting, which was a horrific idea. Why mm. why would you bring over moose just for hunting? The um the last sighted moose was seen and shot in 1952 and sadly that's it like we never saw another moose in new zealand ever again that's kind of sad yeah that's i'm I'm sad i i know 19 years pass then suddenly rumors apparently a moose was sighted in 1971 which (gasps) sparked a less violent type of hunt for the creature. And in 1972, a moose antler was found. (gasps) Just the antler, nothing else. So um, the government, or at least New Zealand's forestry service, decided to task a Mr Ken Tustin uh, to determine whether these gentle giants were still existent in New Zealand. He determines that a small population possibly inhabited the Dusky Sound area, which is sort of like off a small, um, sort of on the coast Mm. of New Zealand, south coast, uh, based on evidence of droppings, antler casts, prints and signs of grazing. But again, no sightings. Okay. 23 years pass. And... uh, we we are now in the lovely year of 1995, the year of my birth. Ooh. Lovely. Uh, a camera that was left on time lapse uh, was believed to have captured a blurry figure moving around. And although the image was distorted by the time lapse, many agreed that the outline of the figure was very moose like. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, you know, this this all seems to be adding up. Yeah. Five years later, in the year 2000, a hair sample was found and it was tested to prove that indeed it was moose hair. And even more hair turned up in the year of 2001 and 2002. Again, no moose sighting. 
It was um, due due to the recent studies. So I think this is just after two thousand and two, where they they found more hair. It's guesstimated that the herd that could be there would be around twenty me strong. And um, so, I guess my question is, where are the meese? Good question. Uh, it's an answer we still haven't found. We we don't know where they are in particular. We know they probably exist, and we've got evidence to point towards it, but no pictures have been taken, and no one has seen one in such a long time. This could be just due to the very low population of New Zealand. But um, the truth is out there. That's so bizarre. I guess it's the same kind of thing as uh, Bigfoot. Hmm. You seem to just find evidence, but you never find it. But the thing is, we're talking about mice here. So (laughs) it's like, you know, they're real and you know, they very well could be there because they were introduced, but you can't seem to catch them, even though you can find all the evidence. We, we know moose exist. Like that's a fact. Ah, yes. The cryptic cryptids that are mooses or meese. (laughs) Mice. So yeah, I, I, it's just a bamboozling question. Where are all the meese? Well, Where are all the meese? <laughs> got a really crap wow. joke. Uh, I, I guess until we find them, it's going to remain moose sealand. I, I thought you were going to say it's a big moose-tory. Oh, yeah, that might have been funnier. <laughs> I hate you both. Uh, but yeah, so that's... Um, that's that's what I brought you, the mystery of the New Zealand moose, or I like as that. I like to call it, the phantom mooses. It's like cryptid, not cryptid. <laughs> yeah, this yeah. Uh, it, it's this attained cryptid status, which I think it's, is quite impressive. It's like cryptid light, or diet cryptid. Cryptid max! Mm. Uh, yeah, cryptid zero. <laughs> I like it, I like it. Uh, okay, so that uh, that just leaves us with uh, our our last segment, as always, which will be um, stuff we like, or we talk about something we've enjoyed between recordings. I'm just going to go first, because it's easy. <laughs> this week, I thought I'd bring up a video game called Hades, oh, which I've okay. been enjoying a heck of a lot. Yeah, this has been, uh, this mm. has been on, the, on the tip of everyone's tongue recently. I, right, yeah, yeah, it has. Um, <laughs> so it's by Supergiant who made a game called Bastion, which I'm told is excellent and has a beautiful soundtrack, which I've heard quite a lot of. Heard a lot of people talk about that game. I love that music. They also made a game called Transistor, which I absolutely love. Um, And again, amazing art style, amazing soundtrack, really fun gameplay, uh, and a plot that I thought was really sort of immersive and enigmatic. So Hades, the Greek underworld, run by, well, Hades. Mm -hmm. You know, that makes sense. Uh, His son Zagreus wants out of the underworld. Uh, and it's filled with a bunch of crap. And by a bunch of crap, I mean a lot of very powerful enemies. Uh, it's a roguelike with lots of RPG elements. And I really want to stress this because I am not a roguelike fan. I am not a roguelike player. I don't do that. I just simply do not have the skill required uh, and do not normally enjoy them. Uh, but this was recommended on a, on another podcast uh, by some games journalists. And I saw it got some pretty good reviews, so I thought I'd give it a quick go. Um as such, I kind of, whenever I have a free minute now, I just pick up Hades and play it. Uh, that's that's my life now. Um, I, I will keep going until I've gotten to the end of Hades, but uh, that has not happened yet. Um, yeah, it's got uh, some little unlockables that last between runs uh, and certain skills that you, that you also keep between runs, which are permanent, which mean there is a, there's a bit of a sense of progression, even when you're starting afresh each time and it's new stuff each time. Uh, and I think my my favorite thing fr- from it, I guess you, yeah, I would call it my favorite. So at the end of every room, you get some kind of reward. Um, but one of the rewards you can get is a boon from one of the Greek pantheon because they're all like, yeah, we're not fans of Hades either, and we totally appreciate that you want out of the underworld. Mm. So sure, we'll help you out. Uh, so you get boons, which is a buff from you might get three to pick from Zeus, uh, you know, the god of thunder, or Artemis, god of the hunt, or um, Athena. Or, you know, any I'd pick a Greek god. Um, and, uh, you know, really cool little system. You get these extra skills that help you sort of come up with a build. And uh, as you're going through, 
if you uh, happen to pick up another boon that's from a god that isn't friends with the uh, god who gave you the first boon, you then have to do an extra fight room because uh, you pick one effectively in order to sort of keep the benefit of both. Okay. Um, and where it gets really inter- interesting, if you have two boons from gods that get on with one another, you get an all new boon, which is like a fusion of the two, which is really sort of, it really shakes up the gameplay quite a lot with stuff that you mm. couldn't really expect. And uh, yeah, it's been, uh, it's been a lot of fun. I've been enjoying it quite a lot. Okay. Uh, mm. Like I said, whenever I get a free minute, I'm like, just, okay, I'll do a run of Hades. Um, overall, really nice style, really nice level design, really nice gameplay, really nice soundtrack. Honestly, it's got to be in the top five of games I've played in 2020. Ah. Um, and I've played a lot of games in 2020. It's been one of those years. Am I right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, nothing better to do. Yeah. So, who's next? Well, I just wanted to quickly pick your brains. Uh, cause, like, yeah, go ahead. I, I don't like roguelites either. And um, I know you said it's, it's like RPG-like. Uh, would you say, uh, is this a good analogy? It's like, you know, when you do, say, dungeons on uh, you know an MMO or something you just get a party together and you jump in yeah. and you do like a raid and then you jump back out is it just kind of like um i would say no but only on the grounds of i'd say it's one step better okay in the sense that so you you have like a, a rest area where you can talk to all these npcs um like you know Hades himself or you know Nyx the goddess of the night okay. um and where you mess with your stats and you change your loadout cuz there's different weapons and things but then also, while you're in the game playing through the dungeons, um, you know, playing through the different layers and playing up to the bosses and stuff, um, you actually interact with all these characters. Like, they still speak to you, so if you get a boon, that god will talk to you. You go into certain rooms, that god will talk to you. You encounter certain NPCs while you're going through the dungeons, they'll talk to you. Um, and then, you know, the game's really self-aware, so if you got up to, say, the... Um, if you get past the first boss, which is normally um, Magira, one of the Furies... Um, if you beat her and then you die when you're in the rest area again, she will be there in the bar. Oh, do you get what I mean? And you can talk to her and it's like the more runs I do, the more lore it gives me, the more stuff I can interact with, the more things I can do. There's a real nice sense of progression in there. Okay. Um, like it doesn't just feel like I go out, I do a run and then I'm back in this rest area where the focus of the game is. No, I'm like also really into these runs as I'm doing them. Like, okay, I need to do this and okay, I need to do the timing and Normally, the reason I struggle with roguelikes is because a lot of the time I can't get the timing down or yeah. I can't notice this little window in the moveset. And I feel like Hades either has that and I don't notice and I do fine anyway, or it just doesn't have that and it's just a lot. I found it to be a lot more accessible than a lot of the roguelikes. And I do believe there's a, a god mode that gives you even more like features that last in between runs and stuff like that. Okay. Um, but yeah. I highly recommend that game for like I think I paid 22 quid on Switch and I'm pretty sure it's a little bit less than that on PC Uh, oh my god 100% worth the money sounds pretty cool yeah who's going next then do you want to answer take it away Oscar (laughs) well I'm gonna give a shout out to uh, nature because um, you know what every time I'm walking to and from work uh I've got a bunch of magpies sitting in the park, chilling out. Bunch of squirrels, bunch of cats. Love it. And uh, it sort of makes, you know, if, if I've had a long day and I'm coming home, it's just nice to hear the birds and look at the animals. They don't care. They're uh, enjoying their life. Nobody's told them what they have to do. They're just <laughs> living their life. Love it. I respect that. Uh, so I'd like to give a shout out to nature. Yeah. Damn. I enjoy nature. I stand. If yeah, there's any 100%. animals listening to this podcast, this one's for you. <laughs> Is the cat still in the room with you, Amber, by any chance? Uh, there's a cat on the windowsill. This one's going out to you, Hazel. In fact, I'm going to say my choice this week is my cat. I love my cats. we got Hazel over there. She was being absolutely cute before. She curled up in bed, and then we put a duvet over her. And she just sort of sat there, like with her head on the pillow. And I, I like the emotions I was feeling. I just couldn't reconcile. There was no way to express as I just kind of squealed and screamed quietly while I clenched my fist and like hugged the door and just kind of like stamped my feet and punched myself in the face. So it was just like, there's just no way to express the kind of like adoration that I had for her, how cute she was. And we got Ivy as well. This is why I want a cat. Ivy is a little 
prick. <laughs> that, that cat has got some high level bastard energy so <laughs> so we were watching the uh the presidential debate the third presidential debate which was on last night very important yeah you know this is like very important you know current affairs in politics and stuff and she was like i'm gonna go and sit on top of the xbox because it's nice and warm and then just hung a paw <laughs> over the edge and just turned it off <laughs> like mid debate and we were just like I even really know and every time we'd pick her up and she'd be like Rawr. and then we'd be sat there for like five minutes and then she'd wander over like ooh nice warm Xbox and we'd pick her up and she'd be like why are you picking me up uh, I still love her she's uh, she's fantastic had some real nice times nice. just sitting with them grooming them making sure they're nice and cosy and comfy and uh, it's quality time and it really it makes me feel better after a rough day I can at least have those, you know, times of just me and the cat having some quality time. Oh. <laughs> I need me one of them babies. <sighs> I, th- I think it was um, Plato or Aristotle, you know, duality of cat. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there's a reason why it was Schrodinger's cat and not like a Schrodinger's pigeon. <laughs> Schrodinger's pigeon. I like that. Scientists love cats. Love them. Mm-hmm. Can't confirm. All right. So is a, should I wrap us up? Sure. Mm-hmm. All righty. Well, I think that'll be us for this week, and we'll be back in uh, two weeks' time. Any topic suggestions or feedback, drop us a comment or email us uh, on phenomenonspodcast at gmail.com. We can even give you a shout-out if you'd like. Peace out, folks, and we'll see you again in two weeks. Bye. Bye. Bye.